so I'd like to welcome you for the last talk in the series this uh, quarter at least. We hope to have many more of the high quality speakers that we've had the, in the previous quarter. Uh, my name is Nicola Alic. I'm with the Photonic Systems Group upstairs. Uh, as all the talks in this quarter, uh, we'll have an hour sort of tutorial level presentation followed by uh, as long as you'd like, uh, long of a Q&A. Uh, so please save your, uh, unless of course the speaker objects to that, save your questions uh, until the end. I would like to just uh, remind you to silence your cell phones so we don't have interruptions during the next hour or so. Uh, as an introduction, uh, today we're very lucky and happy to host uh, Dr. Vasu Pas uh, Parthasarati. Parthasarati, yeah. yeah. Good. Yes. Um, he earned his PhD from uh, a famed Princeton. RPI, uh, after which we, he spent some time in Bell Labs, uh, uh, and after which he found a safe haven, I'd say, uh, up in Irvine uh, with Broadcom. Um, fittingly, I think, uh, or more recently, he's been working on CERDIS, yes. uh, that are a very important practical uh, application, and very challenging one, as I'm sure you'll find out if you're not aware of that. Uh, for me, working in optics, that's pretty much a crucial element uh, coming from the electronics towards the optical world. So I'm also as excited to hear the latest and greatest about this. So without further ado, Vasu, please take the podium. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Can you, can you hear me? This is good? All right. So I've been working in CERDES for about 20 years now, and interesting how I got into this area. It, my background when I started off at Broadcom was not CERDES. I was hired to do switching <laughs> and specifically something on uh, quality of service and scheduling which was my uh, work in the uh, labs and I'd worked a little bit on HDTV too there. Uh, so what happened is I joined Broadcom and uh, the day I joined they bought a switching company. So my GM at that time, he comes to me and says, oh, you know what, it'll take three months to integrate that company in. Meanwhile, I have this thing called CERDES. It's very straightforward, only three months work, some data coming in, <laughs> you, you take the data, you just slice it, you're done. And it just needs some help. Uh, sure, what do we need to do? So somewhere along the line, I had also learned how to do a hardware design. So though my background is algorithms, so I had gotten tired of going to and asking people, can I build this multiplier? Is this feasible? So I got tired of that. So I had collected knowledge where I'd taken classes and learned how to do VHDL coding, hardware design, synthesis, the whole thing, right? I could do the. So he said, we need some help in somebody who does the algorithm but also implements it. I said, all right, whatever, it seems boring, but whatever, three months, okay, you know. Let me finish it and get to switching. It's been 20 years, and I'm still doing 30s. So, <laughs> so uh, it's been a lot of fun. And the reason I'm doing it is not because I've had to do it anymore. When I started off, I had to, but I like it. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of challenges. And I think I've spent a lot of time flipping over Messerschmitt and Lee and all the digital communication books in the course of finding algorithms or finding closed form expressions and it's been very challenging, and hopefully I can share some of my experience in CERDES with you today. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do in the talk, right? I didn't want to do, CERDES is a very interesting topic. It's, it's not just a challenge. The challenge is not just technical. There's a big business challenge in the CERDES too, which is very, very interesting portion of the business. And to be profitable in this business, needs a lot of, uh, like I guess in any business, but there's a, the risks I see sometimes are much higher than a uh, lot of the other IC businesses. And I'll go over why. So without any further delay, let me start talking a little bit of the CERDES technology, right? Uh, I'll start off with all the media, uh, you know, the media that is the CERDES products have to cover, the copper backplanes, the copper transceivers. When I say copper, this is like your copper cable, like the HDMI cable, USB cable. Then we talk about a little bit of the optical links. We'll talk about the IEEE standards that are there in CERDES. We'll cover primarily the CERDES 
uh, in the data center applications. There's a parallel side of the CERDES, which is for the long haul. This is like 500 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers. I'll briefly touch on it, but that is a separate topic in itself, and we won't go too deep into that today. And finally, we'll end up in some of the topics, interesting research topics that people could work on in this area. Uh, my focus, again, on this talk, though it is uh, CERDES, is more DSP-oriented. It's not optics directly in the sense that I'm not trying to talk about how to design a good transimpedance amplifier, but more on how to design a very good DSP receiver uh, to, to cover your link. All right, so a little bit of the CERDES motivation. So when I started off, my definition of a CERDES was you get a parallel bus and a clock, you just have to capture the data. You have to take the clock, resample the data, you're done. That's CERDES. <laughs> and, you know, it's funny, over time, I think I've ended up using most of the equalizer structures that are there that are taught in classic textbooks. And my impression of CERDES, as I see it now, I go back 20 years, was very naive. Uh, so CERDES has evolved a lot. The early CERDES was like I drew in here, parallel I.O., right? You had n-bit bus coming in, a clock coming in, you resample it, you're done. Today, CERDES has evolved. It is what is a truly called a serializer. You have a serial bus. You don't have a parallel bus anymore, right? Serial bus, or maybe you have like, you know, two-bit serial, four, well, two serial lines, four serial lines. But in some sense, it's a serial bus. And you have an equalizer and a CDR, which is recovering your data on the receiver side. So there's been a massive evolution from the early 30s days. Um, now, going back to the 30s, Let's talk a little bit about the media first. Right? What is what is CERDES? So you use CERDES in some form every day. USB, HDMI, uh, all the cables that you use, Ethernet. These are all some form of serializer, deserializers. But the, the CERDES that I'm going to focus on today is inside the data center, right? It connects the racks inside the data center. Within the data center, the, the links going from one data center to another, that is the form of CERDES I'm interested in. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong direction, I guess. So wh where, is this, where is all these CERDES used? Well, data centers. So a little bit on the data centers. Uh, data centers is very interesting. Somebody explained to me once like this. The data centers that you look here, yeah, you use this terminology a lot, but when you go to some of them, they are so huge. And the reason I say that is, this is where reliability comes in. Your components have to be very reliable. So some of the data centers, for example, I've heard that data centers in Microsoft are so big, by the time they start putting in equipment for the last track, they are going and changing the equipment of the first track because it's become outdated. That tells you how huge some of these data centers are. So this is one of the primary endpoints for CERDES. Second is enterprise, service providers, like your wireless backhaul, wireless networks, right? Your AT&T, long distance carriers. These are all primarily endpoints for using CERDES. Now, if you go back to a data center, so the traditional data center has a bunch of switches, okay? So this is what is called a leaf spine architecture, which is prevalent in this data center. So if you go back, you see all those racks in here? Those racks are all switches and the switches are organized in some form. This is not the only configuration, but this seems to be the most popular configuration today. What is called a leaf spine architecture. You have racks and racks of the leaf switches, which are connected to spines, and all these spines are connected to each other within a data center, and one data center aggregates to another data center through another pipe. Now, how do all these things connect? So I had uh, I told you about uh, the USB and HDMI, but those are not the only CERDES today. You have SGMI, fiber channel, the whole bunch of links. Uh, for example, if you look at your base station there, the base station to uh, the processing unit, there's a serializer in there which takes the data from the data center, and I mean, sorry, from the base station and sends it over to the processing head end. Uh, so, Let's go back to the data center one more time, right? So this is what is called a copper interconnect. The copper interconnect is when 
the units or the switches, or the switch fabrics, talk to each other through a copper interface. What do you see in here? Let me see if I can get this. This is what is called a backplane. Okay. So inside the backplane, you have many of these paddle cards. So you'll see, you have all these boards that mesh into all these units in here. So you have to talk from one end to the other end. That goes through the copper backplane here. Inside the PCB, you have a lot of these routes and traces which uh, interconnect the series. Now, this is another form of series, right? Instead of this backplane, you have this copper cable here, right? So this, the series switch sits, well, the, this plugs into a switch. The serializer, deserializer unit sits here. It sends it over to the other transmitter, or other receiver on the other side. Now, if you look at optics, this, it, it, it's similar, right? Instead of copper, you have all these optical interconnects. You have a module, you have a module head end unit, uh, module unit sitting here. The series chip sits in there, goes through all this fiber in here, and talks to the unit on the other side. Now, if you take a look at what is inside the unit, there's a little PCB card, and there's a series chip sitting here. So what's the role of the series chip in here? It takes care of all the equalization and the clock data recovery for going over either the copper or the optics. That's the role of the series chip. Now, there com it comes in many flavors. You could have a single uh, copper cable or uh, optical fiber, or you could have a lot of breakout, what they call as breakout cables, where one unit just goes into four or ten different units. So, so like I told you, the first series when I started working on was 1.25 gig, like uh, let's say a gig. Over 20 years, uh, it's been about 18 years, right? Today, the highest speed of series today is 100 gig, okay, at least for the data center units. And if you go to long haul, it's about 400 gig. So tells you the, the amount of speed increases that have happened over time, right? Uh, let me see, did I skip a slide? Okay, no, I'm okay. All right, so what happened here? How did we get from one gig to 100 gig? Well, a bunch of things. We added more fibers. We parallelized the streams a little bit. But fundamentally, what I want to point out is the fundamental change that happened in here, we used, started using more DSP. The early 30s was what was called NRZ, non-return to zero. You had just zeros and ones going over. It was like the typical binary signaling that you use. Today, the modern 30s is much more sophisticated. You use higher order modulation like PAM. In fact, if you go to the long haul communication, you use QAM signaling. It's much more sophisticated. So essentially, you got much more bits per bar. That's one way that you went in started getting into higher and higher speeds. But with that, you started entering and getting into more complex scenarios. You needed more equalization because the channel became more complicated. And we'll get into more details of all that later in the talk. So this is a, just a little bit more continuation of the slide. I don't know how much details you needed. Uh, so why did we need advanced modulation, right? So if you take the copper cable, the problem with the copper cable is there are a lot of notches. What we call as notches is where the signal just dies. So if you look at frequency, if you look at the frequency spectrum of the copper cable, there are what is called suckouts. Suckouts is basically this, is a huge loss, and you need to compensate for that loss. Now, as you go to higher and higher speeds, it's hard to do that, right? You need huge amounts of equalization. That leads to a lot of problems. So a way around it is to use higher order modulation. When you use higher order modulation, the bandwidth needed, it comes down because you're not, you're bypassing all the suckouts. So that's one of the, uh, that is one of the reasons why higher order modulation started taking off as the speeds in the series began to increase. Um, one important thing I told you, right, it's very hard to be, successful in this business because you have to be right on a bunch of factors. And let me go over it one by one. So this is the time span 
a little this tells you a little bit of a, a little more dramatic i guess on how long it takes for a standard or a, a product to enter from a standards phase to the mainstream in the service environment so 2011 this is just an example an initial pitch was made in the ieee right the pitch was for moving from nrz or non return to zero signaling to something higher a pam4 higher order modulation so that became a standard in 2012 right so this started in early 2011 to end of 2012 so 2013 we started seeing the first samples of higher order modulation series chips 2014 you started seeing full blown products maybe revenue maybe 2015 16 after the qual cycles were done so take a look so from 2011 to 2015 or 16 is a five year window that's that's the amount of time four to five years it takes for you to pitch an idea to get into uh, full blown revenue so what is the issue here the issue is you have a lot of proliferation there are many competing standards okay what this ieee standard the oif the bunch of forums making standards on top of it there are many people making what is called multi source agreements this bunch of vendors get together they agree on a technology they said they go to a uh, ic manufacturer say can you go build this right so there's a bunch the whole bunch of MS msas floating around so these are you take a speed many ways of building the same thing each of them slightly different from each other so the issue then becomes that if you want to make a chip which one do you target okay second problem you have all these modules each of them have a different what is called form factor or size right or x coordinate and y or x dimension and y dimension which is different so look at all these modules right different there are different capacities power capacities different sizes which one do you want to target so you make a uh, you start building a service chip and you target a certain size it may not fit into one of these modules right so by not fitting into those modules you let go of a business space what's the issue there okay so take a look at the semiconductor uh, semiconductor uh, nodes that are okay take a look at some of the semiconductor nodes as they have shrunk over time today it's 7 nanometer that's the dominant semiconductor node or the emerging semiconductor node i should say right so the there's a big cost manufacturing uh, the cost involved here to manufacture a chip at 7 nanometers right so let's use a number say roughly 10 million right then there's engineering cost involved throw in a number another 10 million so it takes 20 million to make something right uh, the, uh, the total uh, cost now you got to recover that cost you go and make a bet uh, you go and make a bet on a uh, on a wrong form factor or a, you know or a wrong uh, standard that you have picked what happens this is what happens here you know <laughs> you basically the whole thing is you don't sell anything you got to wrap up the business so this is the risk in the city space a big proliferation of standards a big prol proliferation of msas and net result is you need to make some bets you need to have a very good knowledge of emerging trends and make some bets and the bets have to pay off so this is the risk in the series business so it took me about 20 years to learn this you know the dsp portion came much faster you know with the business side it took me a lot of lot of time to learn when you you bet on something you think it's going a certain way and you realize oops so it's a challenging business from a business side though it's a very uh, fun business from a technical side a small break here i need to catch my breath a little bit you are uh, free to interrupt me if you have any questions at any time so so let's i like i told you right i targeted the stock more to the uh, dsp side of things but i wanted to give you an idea of the business side too because that's one of the things you don't read about in the books but it's a reality over there 
let's talk a little bit of the Surdi's channel issues, right? So what is it that we are fundamentally fighting with, right? What is it that you build a chip towards? What are the issues? Well, the first thing is your passive loss, right? Optical passive loss in optical fiber, resistive loss in copper cables. You have ISI. This is a classic intersimple interference that you come across in any DSP class, right? Uh, smearing of symbols. Crosstalk. This is a very, very big issue in Surdi's chips. Crosstalk comes from the, the nearest neighbor. You have a bunch of Surdi's chips put out on a switch. They start interfering with each other, right? This is a real issue. <laughs> Thermal noise. That's, that's always there when you have an analog front end, right? Jitter. When you have a PLL and you have an external reference clock, you always have jitter. So these are the, then you have a lot of nonlinear problems, but those are second order and I'm not going to go over that, but these are the fundamental issues that any Surdi's chips faces. Uh, so take a look at a fiber, right? Your input, uh, this is what ISI does, right? You take an input pulse, it, it comes out, it's smeared out. This is the classic ISI problem that you have to solve. Okay, so I'm going to go over an example of a black plane, right? So if you look at, this is a backplane, this is a real backplane. This is built for 25 gig, for, uh, this was a customer backplane. We measured some data out of it. I wanted to get you a feel. Remember today, uh, some of this data in Surdis is proprietary. I cannot show you some of the data at 100 gig. These are proprietary links, but I can show you at 25. And what you see at 25 also translates in speed to 100. As you go to 100, you see some of the effects that you see in 25. Things have gotten better, but the core prompts are still there. Um, so you have two, uh, two, uh, two types of material used. One is FR4 and one is Mecton 6. The frequency drops off very fast, and based on the material, whether it's FR4 and Mecton 6, sometimes it drops off faster, sometimes it drops, drops off slower. In both cases, why can't you use a better material? There are cost impacts involved. One is about three to four times higher than the other in cost. So there are trade-offs involved in cost, uh, and you know you get better performance based on the cost too, right? Uh, so uh, take 25 gig. If you have to use NRZ signal, you operate somewhere over here. Uh, let's say where is it? Yeah, you operate somewhere over here. 6.25 gig Nyquist. So you have to support about 30 dB of insertion loss. Did I get it right? Well, it depends. 6.25 if you're doing PAM4, 12 and a half gig if you're doing uh, NRZ. So in essence, you have to support 30 dB of insertion loss. That's your target. On the other hand, if I don't use copper, I use fiber. The loss is low. There's no EMI issues. The bandwidths are high. But it's not as simple as using copper. Copper is a little bit more of plug and play with optics. You need to use trans impedance amplifiers. You need to convert your electrical signal to optical signal, there are other headaches involved. Okay, so let's get a little bit more into the fiber. There are two types of fiber which are dominant today in use. One is multimode fiber, which is used for uh, short haul communication. This is the maximum distance that is used today is about 300 meters. Uh, even 300 is a, re a kind of stretch. Most of the people use it for 100 meters. And the other side you have single mode fiber. Single mode fiber is used for two kilometers, 10, 80, uh, more long haul communications. It, you can use it for short, uh, how to, there's nothing wrong with it. There's just a price point is different for these two. A Lot of the things in the Surdi's business is price point driven, right? These, uh, it's like a USB cable. You won't buy it unless it's cheap, right? So it's, there's so many Surdi's product, I mean, Surdi's channels over there, the volumes are so huge that the price points have to be low. So, mm -hmm. so some of these compete against each other. You can use single mode fiber in a multi-mode link, meaning you can replace the multi-mode link with a single mode link. There's nothing wrong, things will work fine, except the cost goes up. So there's a cost performance trade-off here. I'll skip over this, all right. I think I talked about a little bit of this. I'll leave it here. If you have any questions, we can get back. Uh, okay, so take an example here. You have a 10 gig series, you want to go to 100 gig series. How do you do that? 
right? So one way you do that is you just use a 100 gig serial link. One lane at 100 gig. Sure, you can do that. The trade-off being that you need to spend a lot more processing power, not more equalization, right? You're not a lot more effort in equalization and processing. The second way you do that is what is called as channel aggregation. Don't use one channel. Use four of them. Run each at 25. So the equalization uh, that is needed is lower, but you're using four channels instead of one, right? So to get from sp one speed to another, you use a mix of techniques. Typically, you don't use just, you just don't take it and just run from speed one to speed two. You try to kind of blend it in. So, for example, when we went from, uh, the standards went from 10 gig to 100 gig, the first generation, they didn't go straight to 100 gig. They went to 4 by 25. Today, the standards are at 1 by 100. So it evolves over time. So it starts off with, uh, you know, man, I'm using the wrong buttons here, sorry. Still getting familiar with this uh, pointer, sorry. Give me one second. Yeah, but sorry. Okay, here we go. So you, you don't just jump in one step. You make baby steps is what I'm trying to get at. Um, we talked a little bit, right? So when you want to operate over a channel, be it copper or optics, one of the first things you pick is what is your loss over the channel. But the loss depends on what modulation format you use. So for example, if you're running at 25 gig, here's non-return zero NRZ signaling, right? This is your Nyquist rate, 12 and a half gig. So the loss is somewhere here. If you use PAM4, that's 6.25 gig. So the loss is more like about 30, 35 dB, right? What I'm trying to get at is the loss or the, uh, the, the loss that has to be compensated on, the insertion loss on the channel, is also dependent on the type of modulation you use. There's no surprise there. That's it's a fact, right? So what you do is you try to play with this curve and you try to pick a, a modulation scheme. What is shown here are different modulations and diff the operating points for this modulation. You try to pick a modulation and an operating scheme that gives you a practical regime where the power is reasonable and you can get the performance you want. Okay. So how does the end-to-end -end CERDIS link look? Remember I showed you the photo of a data center, right? Look at this. This is a uh, racks and racks of leaf switches and racks of spine switches and they're all interconnected. How does end-to-end CERDIS link look? So take one of these, one of the switches in one, of, uh, one rack, take a rack here and pick one of the switches. I've, draw, I've kind of uh, expanded it here. This is how it looks like. You have a switching fabric, which is a cross point, right? It's taking a bunch of packets from A, setting it over to B, and around the fabric is a whole bunch of CERDIS links. The CERDIS links just serialize the data, send it over, and either the media that it's sending over can be an optics or it can be a copper cable. Uh, there's a whole bunch of copper cables here. The, the CERDIS inside the switch itself can talk to the other CERDIS directly. You don't need anything intermediate. You don't need to retime the data because the CERDIS in here is powerful enough to uh, go from switch one to switch two. Uh, sometimes, the media is, too, uh, is bad, you're not able to do that by the CERDIS in here is not able to talk to the CERDIS in here. You need to what, do what is called a retime link. You put an external CERDIS, so the, the data in here goes to this point and he sends it over to here. So in other words, you have four CERDIS links in this path before the data goes from fabric one to fabric two. In here, you have only two CERDIS links. If you have optical fiber, same thing, right? The CERDIS in here talks to CERDIS in here, that goes to the optics, talks to another CERDIS in the module here, goes over to CERDIS in the fabric. So this is called an end-to-end -end link. Now, brings up a lot of interesting research questions. When you put error correction in here, is it good to do end-to-end, -end, or is it good to do what we call segmented error correction? You, you begin the error correction here, terminate here, 
re restart it here, terminate here. Well, the trade-offs being that when you restart, regenerate, re-terminate, you're adding power to all these modules, right? And on top of it, the latency is increasing. There's a lot of interesting problems that come up that people are still looking at, right? Because you need to have end-to-end -end models of links. You need to find out what's the impact of error propagation. How well does FEC do end-to-end? -end? Is it is it enough to compensate the link? A lot of research topics that people are looking at. Let me skip over this. Okay, so we talked about optical modules. What's inside an optical module? Here's an example, right? Here's the Surdi's chip itself. This is the driver. This is a transmitter, right? It goes over the signal. This is an electrical signal here. It gets amplified, goes to a E2O, what is called as a TOSA. Inside the TOSA is an electrical to optical converter. Typically, this is like if you use a multi-mode fiber, it's a VIXEL. If you use a single-mode fiber, it can be a DML or an EML, or it can be a silicon photonics chip, where the optics itself is in silicon, right? And finally, it goes over fiber. So what this MUX does is it aggregates a whole bunch of, you could have four, four uh, parallel fiber, four, four pa parallel channels here that's aggregated onto a single fiber. This can be four wavelengths here. It's put on the same fiber through a MUX. You have a DMUX on the other side. The photo detector converts the optics back into electrical world. The signal gets amplified. You, it's uh, either is a pin, T, you know, is a pin or an APD as a TIA. The TIA is a trans impedance amplifier. It's a very high gain amplifier. Then finally, a Surdi's chip on this side does the recovery. So I'm going to go talk a little bit about the the TX and the RX and the DSP involved in this. Before that, I'll show you how this looks. Here, how it looks in three dimensions, right? You have the fiber coming in. Uh, first, you have the toza going out, goes to a fiber, and the same thing. The same diagram that I showed you in a kind of two uh, 2D geometry, this is how it looks in 3D. Uh, let me take a, take a quick water break here, and then uh, we'll continue. Oh my, I'm doing on time. I don't know, half an hour? Okay. okay. All right. So let's talk about the DSP design of the series, right? I took a simple example here. So here's the data coming in, right? This is how it looks like before you do any digitization. Right after digitization, you see something like this. After equalization, obviously it gets better. And finally, after error correction, you get back the original transmitted symbol. This is the basics of any DSP textbook, right? <laughs> okay. So let's get into a little more details of what is the block, what are the blocks involved in this, in the DSP. Uh, so there are two types of DSP CERDES that are used. One is what I call analog CERDES or integrated CERDES, and one is a discrete or a digital series. Now, there's nothing that stops one from taking an analog series and put it inside a discrete series. You can do that. But where I'm trying to get at is there's fundamentally two divisions in the series that are built today, an analog design and a digital design. So fundamentally, in analog design, there is no A to D conversion. You take the data coming out, all the equalization is done in the analog world, and sliced, and you get the digital data out. On the other hand, you can have a digital series, which is an A to D based system, where you have an A to D converter, equalized in the digital domain, everything is done in the digital world. You know, once the analog to di digital conversion happens, the DSP takes over, cleans up the whole signal, does the error correction, sends it over. So two divisions uh, distinct in the series today. What happens is most of the people today, when they build a switch, inside the switch, the series used, is an analog series. The external series, so the standalone ASICs, or standalone chips, use a digital series. That's a typical convention. But there's nothing stopping anybody from taking an analog series and putting a, building a, st a standalone chip out of it. So this is how a typical analog series looks at a high-level block diagram. Right? Uh, you have a driver sending a signal over, coming in, a VGA which boosts the signal, 
a CTF, which is an important part of an analog SERDES, which is a, all it is is a, what we call the SERDES world, a peaking filter, or also known as a continuous time linear equalizer. It is a high frequency boost. Then you have a transmission line FFE, and uh, you know people don't typically build this in the analog. Though I've shown it here, you can have it, but these are very hard to control over uh, voltage and temperature. They're not very precise in the analog world. It's better left to do the digital world. So though I've said you can use a transmission line and do equalization in the analog world, it's not very common. What is common is a DFE. People build a DFE in analog uh, designs by the DFE is done in the because it's it's based on the uh, digital data uh, after the data is sampled. So you people do that for analog service, but don't do an FFE. On the other hand, you can use it. The digital architecture is very similar. It has the same equalization components like a FFE, DFE. But remember, the ADC is the separation between the analog world and the digital world. So all your FFE is happens in the digital world. Your time recovery is done digitally. Your DFE is done digitally. So this portion on, everything is digital. So what is the advantage here? So when you go into the digital world, you have better control over, uh, in the studies over voltage and temperature and process, right? So uh, manufacturing is easy, reliability is better, uh, you get better yields. So a lot more benefits in doing things digitally. Um, the same thing like I told you. So there has to be benefits in doing. Why do people build analog studies then? Well, analog studies is if you're doing something for very short reach, 10, 10 millimeters, or say, you know, uh, very low insertion loss, like a 15 dB insertion loss. It's kind of an a, it's a overkill to use ADC. The, the ADC comes with inherent power implications. The power is typically higher, right? So, so what happens is if you want to use low loss channels or low uh, short distance links, people build analog FFE structures. And when you go to longer reaches, people build ADC uh, DSP based structures. That's typically how the industry has evolved. So a little bit on the ADC landscape. You know, uh, you know, there's a professor at Stanford called Boris Merman. He maintains this links which shows ADC evolution over time. So uh, there's a typo in here. This is, it says 2016. It's really 2018. So if you look, at, the reason I pointed it out is as speeds in SERDES have evolved, and today, like I told you, you get 100 gig SERDES links, the ADC speed also has to evolve with that, right? I mean, uh, you know, at one gig you needed processing of you know one gig as, you know one gig a sample per second. Today at hundred gig, you know that's fifty six gigabaud with PAM four. So you need to do fifty six giga samples per second. So take a look over time, the ADC speeds have also increased. So what is this is more like a feasibility study which shows that today you get. So what is, what is in the y-axis is uh, a figure of merit for ADC performance, right? So you get very low speed, uh, not low speed, high speed, low power ADCs today operating all the way up to 100 gig. So that's the state of art today uh, collected over most of the leading conferences like the ISCCC where they've shown, uh, people have shown implementations of very high speed uh, studies uh, sorry, high-speed ADCs, which can be used for SERDES, primarily for SERDES designs. So when people build ADC for SERDES, for example, 100 gig, you don't build a single 100 gig SERDES. That's way too complicated. What you do is what is called an interleaved design. This is, uh, people take a low-speed design. For example, a high-speed high ADC of 100 gig, you would build an ADC at one gig and you would interleave 100 of them, right? It's like stitching, right? You stitch, take a small piece of cloth, you stitch it to another piece of cloth, you get a bigger piece, put it together 100 times, you get a much bigger piece. Same thing happens in ADCs. It's very interesting. These are called time interleaved ADCs. This is how modern ADCs are built for, uh, for service applications. But when you do time interleaving in ADCs, you suffer a lot of uh, impairments not from the channel, from the fact that you're stitching components together. 
and you have gain offset, you have DC offset, you have skew mismatch, uh, you have bandwidth mismatch because you're stitching 100 components in the example I gave you together. Each of the components, though are primarily the same circuit, there are circuit mismatches, right? In layout, some, some layouts may be a little bit longer, a little shorter. So you get some mismatches due to that, right? Uh, so these, these pro, uh, it's a very interesting DSP problem. How do you solve a blind, AD, how do you calibrate an ADC blindly, right? It's a very interesting research problem. Um, most of the publications you see from industry, you won't, they won't tell you how, right? Uh, we, we build a lot of these. Uh, the know-how is held as a tightly guarded secret. But it's a very interesting research problem on building, taking low-speed ADCs and building uh, high-speed ADCs by doing D, using DSP to compensate for all the mismatches. Um, I'll tell you a little bit that I can talk about without giving details. First generation ADCs, the calibration was built. It was a guided calibration, right? Uh, Basically, you had a whole bunch of uh, first generation people use calibration signals to calibrate. Second generation, they got away from the calibration signals. It's blind, right? You don't know what data you're getting. You're getting some data, and uh, you use the equalizer to compensate that the channel, the equalizer, the function of the equalizer is to compensate for the channel. But you can also use the equalization to compensate for the ADC mismatch. This is called sharing the equalizer for solving not just the channel, but also the analog front end impairments. This is a second generation ADC. Uh, now, you also sometimes use the low speed ADC to kind of help you in the calibration. Today, the, uh, what I call in here third generation modern ADCs is completely blind. It's just the ADCs, there's no help, no guide. It's self calibrating. Uh, this is the uh, state of art in ADC design now. Um, so what happens when all the mismatches? So this is data that I show from one of our older uh, generation designs. Uh, I cannot obviously get the data from the latest generation it's, uh, and put it in public domain. So this is our 10 gig ADC. Uh, here's the ADC E knob or effective number of bits, right? Which is a figure of merit for the ADC. Here's how it looks like without calibration. Look at how fast it falls off. When you start using calibration, uh, gain calibration, and start using phase calibration, the ENOP gets better and better. Remember, this, this is very interesting. What I did was I took some low sp speed components, I stitched it together, it created some uh, impairments, I solved for all the imper impairments by DSP. In effect, I got a high speed design out of stitching a bunch of low speed designs. Very interesting, how have you solve, how modern ADCs are being built and used. Let's talk a little bit of the equalization now, right? So you'll find that as thirty speeds have increased, all the textbook equalizers that uh, people have proposed in all the classics textbooks are being used. Uh, initial studies, low speed studies start, started, started off using analog linear equalizers. Today, most of them use digital linear equalizers all forms of sophisticated equalization, including a DFE, which is an IR filter, a decision feedback equalization, and the, you know, the, the Witterby or the MLSE equalization, right? Maxi uh, the maximum likelihood sequence estimation. That, today's studies are built with uh, MLSEs. Uh, we're running short of time. I'm gonna skip, skip uh, some of the details of the, uh, what happens with DFEs. I'll just talk about one, one thing here that you have to watch out for. When you use more and more sophisticated equalization, you have to worry about something that it brings is error propagation. Uh, when you use uh, feedback filters and even things like, M uh, even algorithms like MLSE, it brings in something called error propagation. So a single error causes a whole stream of errors. This is something which is, uh, uh, explored a lot in the standards, which we model a lot very carefully, because error propagation can kill your link, right? When you have a whole burst, you can bring your whole link down. It can overwhelm the FEC, overwhelm your error correction capability, and just bring the link down. 
there are well, so the, there are techniques that you use, uh, signal processing techniques you use to limit the error propagation. Uh, one of one way is called precoding. Uh, you would have seen a lot of this in the classic DSP textbooks. Precoding limits error propagation. I'll leave it. I won't get into the details of that, but yeah, precoding is one way that you use to limit error propagation. Uh, second way that you can use to limit error propagation is what is called precoding, uh, TH precoding, uh, or Tomlinson Harashima precoding. It takes the DFE, it takes the equalizer, and moves it to the transmitter, right? The, uh, there are some issues that come with that. You lose some signal energy. I won't get into details, but that's yet another technique that you can use. You can take the whole equalizer, instead of keeping it in the receiver, you move it to the transmitter and try to solve the error propagation problem, right? Because you're working with transmit symbols, which don't have error propagation, versus receive symbols. Yet another way to, you know, uh, yet another technique to do equalization. Okay, let's skip over all that. Okay, this is more interesting. So this is what a complete uh, receiver looks like. Um, this is a realistic slide. I've used this for, with customers, so <laughs> this is not something I drew up. This is something which represents a real chip. So a DSP-based chip with interleaved ADCs has all these blocks, right? It's, uh, highly parallel ADCs, the calibration logic, a feed-forward e equalizer, a post-processor, and finally uh, FEC, right? Now, whole bunch of loops here, Adaptation loops to control all the calibration, to control the equalization, to control your front end. Uh, there's a timing recovery unit which helps in slicing. Everything is built in the digital domain. Okay, let's quickly, we're, we're running short of time, right? right? Like I said, when I put the slides together, I had so much to talk over, right? 20 years that I worked in this area. So I didn't know where to stop. So I kept putting slides after slides after slides. So uh, now I'm running short of time. <laughs> um, okay, so going back, why do we need FEC? So it's a, the way I look at FEC is it's a cheap way of getting, addressing SNR shortfall. When you cannot meet your target signal to noise ratio and you've done all the equalization possible, there's only one other thing you can do is use error correction. Right, so if you look when the early if, uh, when the early SERDES days, there was no error correction used. It was just a dumb SERDES. You slice the data, send it over. Modern SERDES use all forms of sophisticated equalization. Uh, let's skip over. Let's skip over. Uh, all right. So this is an example from the standard. Right, modern SERDES use uses a Reed-Solomon code. I'll talk a little bit of that. Why use Reed-Solomon code? Why not use convolution codes? Complexity is very high. Uh, why do we use, why don't we use uh, trellis codes? Same problem, high power. Why don't we use LDPSEs? Latency is high, power is high. So today, all the studies that I know of for data center applications stop and use it, stop with using block codes, like Reed solomon codes or BCH. Now, that's not to say there's a lot of interesting research happening in using product codes, uh, two-dimensional block codes, to enhance the performance and get even more gain out of it. All right, let's skip over, skip over. Okay, something interesting. So, here's what we did about, I think it was four or five years ago, right? We ordered a bunch of uh, cables from, uh, through Amazon, and uh, here's a Thunderbolt cable, an eSATA e cable, a USB cable, and a direct attached cable, also known as CX1. So we connected it up to one of our SERDES test chips. And here, what you see is a PAM4 signal transmitted. After equalization on each of these channels, we recover the PAM4 signal back. Here's the recovered histogram. Uh, if you tilt it by 90 degrees, what you'll see is the four PAM4 levels uh, clearly visible. So the chip has equalized out all of these channels. What I'm getting at is some of these channels are very low bandwidth channels. The USB is a low bandwidth channel. But take a look. Running at 32 gig that the chip was running at, 
I was able to equal after error correct after equalization. I was e able to equalize all the channel impairments out and open the eye out completely. Pretty interesting, right? What uh, DSP can do for you, We're taking low cost cables. This was just cables we ordered straight out of Amazon, plugged it in, boom, the eye opened out. So, so what about longer haul optics? Remember. Everything that I talked today was only short haul data, uh, data center communication. There's a completely parallel branch called current communications, long haul optics. So current communication is very different from data center communication. Traditional data center communications are uh, more what I would call single dimension modulation in my terminology is you, you have a, a modulation like PAM4, which is uh, I only, right? As opposed to a QAM signal, which is I and a Q. It's a two-dimensional modulation. So you have more efficient communication. You can send information not just in amplitude, but also in phase, right? So long-haul communication typically uses current. Now, there's a reason for that, right? It's very hard to meet uh, the long-haul requirements for metro, 500 kilometers, or 1,000 kilometer links by using simpler mod modulation like uh, PAM4. So they go to much more sophisticated modulation schemes. It comes at a price. Uh, the price being that it is much more expensive, power is very high, but think about it, 1,000 kilometer lengths, the cost structure in those markets support it. It's okay, right? Instead of something costing $1,000, it costs Nine hundred dollars or eleven hundred dollars. It's not. It's not a big deal, right? Because those are niche markets. It, the technology is more important. You have to solve the link. You have to close the link. The, it's not a cost-driven market, right? It's a more performance-driven market. So, in those markets, that's why you have more, much more sophisticated equalization. Uh, the equalization there is orders of magnitude much more uh, difficult than what you have in data center. The equalization there is, a, for example, you would use like a 500 tap FFE in frequency domain as opposed to a 10 or 15 tap FFE in time domain. So uh, orders of magnitude more complicated. You have to do carrier recovery, uh, beyond clock recovery, you know, IQ, the IQ phase mismatch. There's a lot of uh, sophistication involved. They're completely different. I could spend another hour talking about it. I skipped about it, but I wanted to give you in the 30s world, there's a completely parallel world, a completely parallel field out there for current where uh, the DSP is much more intense and you can take a look at it. And it's an active field of research because uh, as opposed to the data center 30s, which are standards based, these are more non-standards based, so more proprietary links. So every vendor out there has their own way of solving the problem. It's not interoperable, but that's okay because you use the same vendor on both sides of the link. So for example, a thousand kilometer link going under the sea from say, uh, or going uh, you know, across the channel, across the English channel, you have a bunch of these links. Sure, I mean, it's not very cost driven. You use the same vendor on both sides. You're not, you don't have to be standards driven, right? It's more proprietary links are fine. So what is happening in the industry today, right? So. One thing that I see is uh, there is a push towards silicon photonics, a lot of investment in silicon photonics, There's a lot of investment also in photonic integration, right? All the muxes and demuxes that I talked about, right? So these are getting integrated. You get a lot of optical integration happening. There's investment happening there. Uh, second thing that is happening is obviously a bias towards going to higher and higher speeds in studies, right? Uh, Remember, I talked to talked to you about current uh, current communication or current DSP used to solve very long haul long haul links like five hundred and thousand kilometers. What I see is some of those technologies are coming to lower speeds, L not lower speeds. Sorry, lower distances. For example, the current standards, which were once at five hundred and thousand kilometers, are now being uh, used for eighty kilometers. So current is slowly entering the data center, right? So as you go towards higher and higher speed, 
it's very hard to take the traditional PAM4 and go to PAM8 and PAM16. You can only go to so far. At some point, coherent will enter to the data center, the point that you will start using them for 10 kilometer links, say at maybe at 250 gig, maybe at 500 gig. You know, they'll start entering, uh, they'll, they'll be intersection where the traditional data center links will become coherent links. Um, so what do I see? In the 20 years, I've seen a big maturity in the CERDIS technology. It is still evolving. Uh, the evolution is taken a different form. Sophistication in DSP is what is happening now. More powerful FECs, more powerful equalization. Uh, it's inevitable to stop the march towards higher speeds because data centers are, require more and more bandwidth. So you have to give them more powerful CERDES, more powerful DSP. It's just work in progress. There's a lot of research to be done lot of interesting problems to be solved. How do you build low power equalizers? Can you do the same digital equalization? Can you do it in analog? Can I build transmit equalizers and make the receive links very simple, right? Can I move all the equalization to the transmitter? So there's a lot of research that can be done from a graduate standpoint too that I think it makes things very interesting. A DSP standpoint, a silicon photonic standpoint, every portion that I see in the CERDIS link, a lot of unanswered questions we take uh, we do do some research at some point to commercialize the product, we stop, we take some educated guesses and move on. But for all the people, I mean, for the graduate students out here, I see some very challenging problems that you can solve which will have good, interesting commercial impact. So. I think we're okay on time. Right? Sorry, I could have talked for one more hour. I had to skip over a lot of slides. So. No worries, that's what the Q&A is for. Uh, do we have any questions for the speaker? Do you want to come up to the mic because it's being recorded? I encourage you to ask questions. If not, I'm going to start asking. So. We don't use high-speed ADCs. No, so what I was trying to tell you is high-speed ADCs today that we use in CERDES, are not, it's not one high-speed CERDES. We take a bunch of low-speed sp CERDES, I'm so low-speed ADCs, stitch them together, right? Uh, take it, think about it as like a piece of cloth, right? You, to make a big piece of cloth, you just stitch a whole bunch of smaller pieces. So to make a 100 gig CERDES, a 100 gig ADC for a CERDES, I would take a one gig series, <laughs> what do you say, so one gig ADC, right? So in time instant one, the one gig ADC produces sample. Time instant two, a different one gig ADC produces a sample. Time instant three, a third one produces. So a bunch of low speed ones, in effect, it's time interleaving. So you use several USB ones. Yes, yes, that's, that's the way modern ADCs are built. So you don't build one high-speed 100 gig ADC. You build a low speed. This is called the SAR architecture, right? Successive approximation architecture. And uh, the reason being is you can build very low power one gig, one gig ADC. Once you have that as a base component, you can stitch and build as high you want, but you got to solve all the calibration prompts. It's an interesting research topic too. How do you solve all the bandwidth mismatches? You know, you know, especially if you don't know what data is coming at you, you have to do it in a blind, blind way. It's tricky. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? I'm sure there are. I have a short question. With all these advances, isn't there a cost in terms of latency? There is. 
There is. Isn't that a requirement also uh, in, in yeah. the applications? So, so I'll tell you, this is interesting on the latency, right? So the latency, this has been talked about in standards a lot. So one thing that has helped in the latency is, so take a one gig signal, right? It takes a certain, the propagation delay is not the issue. It's a processing delay. So if I want to build an error correction code, and let's say the error correction code, just for example, I need 10 samples in there. And the CERDES is a one gig CERDES. So I have, I have to take 10 samples of one gig series. So it takes you 10 nanoseconds. But at 400 gig, or at 100 gig, let's say 100 gig, the data comes to you 100 times faster. So in effect, the latency comes down because the time it takes to pack in a FEC frame is faster because the data is coming at you faster. So the processing delay from a packet point of view is, is, is not that bad. The problem is that you have to do a lot of parallel processing to be able to uh, process that. But the actual latency itself is not an issue because the data is coming at you faster. You need to think about how do you pack in, how do you pack a, a frame with data coming to you at a slow speed. So you have to wait for, a, it's like a car traveling at one kilometer versus 100 kilometers. The time it takes to go from point A to point B is much, it takes a longer time. But when it comes to you faster, you, you fill it in faster. So the processing time can be done faster as long as you parallelize enough. The actual propagation delay, that's not a problem. You're going at, I don't know, for fiber you go at like 0.6 times the speed of light or something like that. So it's, it's not a, it's not, the actual traversal time, propagation delay is not the issue. It's like, how do you build, you need to give, you need to get the pipe going. You need to keep flushing it out. You need to keep the pipe going. That, to build uh, the DSP, you need highly parallel DSP. Though I said equalizers here, the equalizers that we build on the chip is highly parallel because you're processing 100 gig every second. So you cannot just, uh, the transistors cannot work as fast. So you, you build very massively parallel equalizers to kind of parallelly process the data. But you're right. I mean, there is there are latency issues, but it can be overcome. It can be overcome. Come to the mic again. Hard to hear. Sorry. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, mostly Reed-Solomon codes are used for the equalization. Uh, yeah. After the equalization. Yeah. Uh, because burst errors should be corrected by e Reed-Solomon codes, but we can do interleaving. Yes. 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 What so this comes down to what he was saying. You can do interleaving to solve the problem. Interleaving adds latency. That's the reason we avoid that. Right. So, for example, when you use, there are applications, right? These are small fractions of the whole overall market. Like, for example, high-speed trading, right? In those links, latency is very important, right? So you cannot use it interleavers. Interleavers uh, add a lot of latency, right? So we try to do away with things like that. Anything that adds latency, for example, we try, we don't use that in the standards. The conscious use. So, for example, BCH codes are very good at random error correction, but not very good at burst error correction. So if you use BCH, you need an interleaver. So we try to keep away from BCH. Now, second thing, if you use Reed Solomon, they are good at burst error correction. So we stick to Reed Solomon. And then there's a lot of things we do that I didn't have time to talk about. So for example, when you use two, uh, when you use 400 gig, when you transfer data at 400 gig, the way you do it is you send four streams of 100 gig, okay? So instead of going A, B, C, D serially, you go A, B, C, D in a parallel. So that itself creates kind of an interleaving structure. So we use a lot of other tricks to kind of create an interleaver without having a dedicated interleaver. So, yeah. Thanks. 
I mean, there's a lot of people doing a lot of research on that multi-level codes. There are a lot of uh, other ways of uh, approaching the problem. You could easily do a thesis on that. Uh, can you give us a little bit of the indication regarding how the third generation, I mean, the blind calibration in ADC, uh, what's the direction we can go for the future <laughs> research? Yeah, I have to be careful in how much I can say in here. Uh, so let me go back. Like I told you, right, line calibration is uh, it's not an easy problem to solve. So let me see. Um, the reason I'm saying I have to be careful here is a lot of uh, IP that we protect in this area, right, because this is our bread and butter. <laughs> um, let me see if I can. Let me go back and say, I'll tell you a little bit of this. Here's the easy thing to solve, is the, the let me see, okay, here we go. The ADC offset calibration, that's just DC offset. That's very easy to solve, right? That's it's just a simple averaging uh, structure that you need to put in there and solve it. Not, not, that's not the problem. The gain mismatch, you think a little bit for a day, you can figure out a way. It's not difficult. This is the one which is the problem, the skew mismatch. Now, ADC1 is sampling at time 1. ADC2 is sampling at time 2. ADC3 is sampling at time 3. Natural order of things. That doesn't happen like that. ADC1 samples at time 1. ADC2 samples at time 1.01 or 0.99. A little bit early, a little bit late because of circuit mismatch. So if you look at your signal, you're a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, right? So that basically drops the ADC E knob a little bit. But that's not, no surprise there. That's known. Um, so to real, that is the trickiest one to solve in the calibration. Okay, and the most challenging one, another challenging one is the bandwidth. But if you think about it some more. You can go solve that in the equalizer. You can. You don't need to put an equalization scheme in the ADC. You can use the equalizer in your DSP to solve that. But the skew calibration is the most tricky one. Um, I'm trying to see how much I can say without saying. Right. So. There are ways to solve the skew calibration in the equalization. If you think hard enough, you can solve that in the equalization. A second way to solve that is you can do that blind also. It's tricky. It needs a lot of simulation and a lot of uh, thinking. But you can come up with schemes to solve the skew calibration without having an equalizer. That's about as far as I can go and say because a lot of the people who build this, they don't publish on how to do this because it, this is what makes one person slightly better than the other is how good your calibration is. But think about it, what I said. It's not difficult. You think a little bit deeper, you can get it. It's interesting, though. It's interesting. Uh, it make a nice thesis. Well, people have done thesis on this, too, right? How do you build a cheap analog component and then go solve that problem in the DSP. So in effect, you're getting an excellent analog performance. By the way, I just explained this for the ADC. It doesn't have to be. It, even the PGA up front doesn't have to be very linear. You can build a kind of rough PGA, go solve that problem in the DSP, and create a very good analog component because you're taking care of the DSP. Same thing in the optics. The TIA doesn't have to be very linear. If you can find out how your DSP can fix that, you've got a great product. But it's an interesting field where what you do is you put together a simpler, a cruder solution, a low, I won't say cruder. Really, this has to be a purpose to it. You don't build a cruder one. You build a lower power one where instead of uh, doing uh, building a higher power, uh, more Accurate component, you build a lower power, coarser component, and you go fix it in the DSP. That's the that's interesting. 
and having said that this is very interesting too uh the traditional adcs that you have seen in textbooks dsp textbooks are all equally spaced levels there's no reason for that right why would you need to have equally space think about it some more you can come up with the optimal structure for your levels where the levels are unequally spaced it's a, how do you do that that's a good thesis topic you know uh it's difficult but doable right how do you build unequally spaced levels which give better end to end performance than the equally spaced levels right you can move the levels to the point where the eye is most closed and get more resolution in there so when the eye is very open you don't need to put many levels in there when the eye is very closed so basically you create a an equal levels and instead of 7 bit adc you can create a hypothetical 8 bit adc with you know with with 7 with 7 bits so uh yeah it's doable it needs creative work but yeah this interesting research topic sorry i can't tell you a little bit more on the calibration i've there's a lot of proprietary ip involved i have two questions of my own yeah. first one um of course uh, with current proliferation standards uh, i'm sure everybody is very much put into a box to reach a certain power envelope but especially with the data rates uh, exploding recently and you've pretty much touched upon that in your talk can you give us an idea about the power dissipation of the, or at least an order of magnitude yeah sure um so it, the way it works in optics world is very interesting right the power dissipation is the chip is important right but the power dissipation is really determined by the module so the module form factor determines the power dissipation for example uh so the let me take a popular form factor okay uh qsfp uh, qsfp module power dissipation max power is 3 and 1/2 watts okay that's that's what it's designed for that's for 100 100 or 400 so no 400 is different this is more for yeah so for 400 uh the module power dissipation uh is people would like 7 they talk more about 10 watts right 10 watts is a power number that people use now let's work back from that 10 watts since it's first generation people are willing to relax right you don't have to, so ideally people would like 7 or 8 watts but you know it's first generation they give you some leverage it's about 10 watts so 10 watts you work back 10 watts is for the module 50% of that is the optics 50% of that is the electronics so it's, it's a fair system we say the dsp is 50 the optics is 50 so the dsp power has to be about 5 watts the optics power has to be 5 watts right you can break it down some more now you go back to the optics and you break down what the component power is by using so 50 50 is a fair number now you have to be very careful with one thing in the optics so you really don't get 5 watts to work with right either in the optics or the because there are regulators in there the regulator efficiency is about typically state of art regulators are at about 80, 80 to 85% regular efficiency so there's some power dissipation in the regulators itself right and it's an integral part of the module nothing you can do you need regulators power supply regulators so so really when it's 5 watts you really get more like 4 and 1/2 watts because you lose 15 to 10 to 15 more like 15% of the regulators so your dsp has to be at 400 watts optics has to be 400 watts I and mean, these are all just rough computations you do just from working back from higher numbers so 10 watts is something today i think in 2 years people would expect more like 7 watts and then the surrogate side of that is how much so this is half, half. right typically people go with anywhere from 50 50 to 60 40 i mean pick a number right some people say 30 should be 40% of it some people say 50 so 50 50 is where the power breaks down okay and one uh, at least from my, from my part the last question is uh, especially with this uh, increase of the of the speeds do you see a place of convergence of uh, optics and electronics in 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 this or this implementation like for example silicon photonics for instance yes or even closer than yeah or yeah. even closer 100 gig yeah. 100 gig is happening i think 100 gig i see 
a big push but i think as you go beyond 100 gig you'll see a lot more of it because it's very hard to do it without that the interconnect you're spending a lot of power the switch is spending a lot of power in the series io just to get the data the process data out of the switch is consuming a lot of power that's one of the handicaps right so people are talking about optical integration and i think 100 gig yeah maybe not that much but beyond 100 gig definitely when i say 100 gig i mean 100 gig serial right 1 by 100 4 by 100 and all that Thank you. Thank you very much.